Uh, welcome everybody to probability analysis webinar. Today we have Joe Neiman from University of Texas in Austin, who is going to talk about large deviations for edge triangle. Please, Joe, feel free to start. Okay, so thanks everyone for coming. Um, I'm going to talk about some joint work with uh, Charles Radin and Lorenzo Sidun, who are also here at UT Austin. And uh, it, it's a little bit about uh, combinatorial probability, but I promise there is some analysis involved, so that will come uh, pretty soon. Okay, but let me let me start maybe with just the combinatorial problem, uh, which is uh, okay. I, I want to count. I want to talk about labeled graphs. So I have a vertex set V, which is uh, say one through n, and an edge set which consists of unordered pairs of vertices. Okay, and uh, and we're interested in asymptotics as n goes to infinity. Now, how many graphs are there? Well, there are two to the n choose two of them, right? Because there are n choose two potential pairs of unordered vertices, I get to choose which of them appear, okay? And I prefer to write it in this more complicated way, okay, which is equivalent, right? I've just said, you know, n choose two is n squared over two up to lower order terms. Okay, so this is one way to write the number of uh, labeled graphs on n nodes. Okay, now one thing that you can ask about a graph is its edge density. Okay, so the edge density of a graph is I take the number of edges, which is a number between zero and n choose two, and I divide by n choose two to get a number between zero and one. Okay, and once I define like this, I can say, well, how many graphs of this two to the n choose two number of graphs, how many of them have edge density E, where E is some number between zero and one? Okay, and this is a uh, pretty straightforward to answer. Okay, it's a uh, well, here's a formula, it's e to the sum constant times n squared up to lower order terms. Okay, we're here, the constant is given by this sort of Shannon entropy function. Okay, how do you show this? Well, okay, a graph with edge density e is you have to choose uh, which e choose two out of all of the n choose two edges are present. Right. How many ways can you do this? Well, it's E and I know it's uh, N choose two, choose E and choose two, right? So that's how many there are. You do Stirling's approximation and you arrive at this formula. Okay. okay. Now, okay, so edge density is, is something fairly easy to understand. Uh, the next thing, the, the next uh, slightly more complicated uh, statistic I can ask for graphs is the triangle density. So a triangle in a graph is a collection of three vertices, all of which are connected. Okay. So the number of triangles is that's the number of collections of three vertices, which are sort of pairwise connected in the, in the graph. Okay. There are potentially up to n choose three of them, right? Because that's how many choices of three I can make. So the triangle density is the number of triangles divided by n choose three, and it's some number between zero and one. And now the question that I want to ask, this is the main question for this talk is, how many graphs have approximately a given triangle density and approximately a given edge density? Okay. And I am most interested in an answer of the form e to the sum constant times n squared plus little plus lower order terms. Okay, I want an answer in the same spirit as, as this. Okay, but I want to know what's the constant depending on, on the edge density and the triangle density. Uh, telling me to highest order in the exponent how many such things are there. Okay. Um, please, by the way, feel free to stop and ask if you have any questions. I'm, I'm, unless people ask about it, I'm going to sort of ignore little things like what do I mean by this and so on. But uh, I'm hoping to, to get across the main ideas. Okay. So uh, the first thing that we need to ask actually is, are there any such graphs? Okay, suppose I give you some E and some tau. Does there exist a graph with that edge density and that triangle density? Okay, and this is a non-trivial question because like if, you, if I tell you that the edge density is very high, then it might not be possible to have the triangle density at the same time below, right? They interact somehow. Okay, so this is an old question in, in uh, extreme combinatorics and it was solved in 2008. Okay, here is, okay, here is my E axis and here is my tau axis. Uh, it's this picture is not to scale, but whatever. This is one. This is one. And this shape here, I'll shade it in. 
is the set of E and tau for which there exist graphs with that edge density E and trigonal density tau. Okay. This upper boundary here is the curve uh, tau equals uh, E to the power uh, three halves. Okay. This dotted line in the middle here is the curve tau equals E cubed. Okay, which has a particular significance that, that if it's not clear, I'll explain it in a second. Um, and these things are, are very much not to scale, but the point is there's sort of a, a countable collection of points here. And there's some sort of algebraic curves in between every pair of points forming the lower boundary of this thing. Okay. This point, okay, this point is important. This is the point uh, E equals a half, tau equals zero. Okay, the graph which realizes this point is the complete bipartite graph where you divide your vertices into two halves and all of the edges between the halves are present. Okay, this has exactly half that could be there, but zero triangles. Okay. Good. Okay, so this is the, the picture of the sort of the feasible region, right? So for any point inside the triangle, inside this sort of funny triangle, right? I can ask how many graphs are there with this edge density and this triangle density? Okay, because everywhere outside the answer is zero. Okay. Ah, yes. And I, I promised to say, okay, what's the significance of this, uh, of this curve here? Well, if I take a graph with edge density E and I just choose a random one, it will most likely have triangle density E cubed. Okay. So this is the graph. With, there, there are lots of graphs on this dotted line and it's much more unlikely to see a graph which is off this dotted line. Okay. Now, there is an answer to this question, okay? Uh, Chatterjee and Varadon and, and Dembo and Lubetsky proved a, uh, a slightly more refined version of this, okay? But basically the answer is the answer that I, okay? There is a constant depending on E and tau, such that the number of graphs with these constraints, well, there are E to the constant times N squared, okay? Um, maybe I'll just sort of briefly say what's the difference between what these guys did. It's in, uh, you know, so Chatterjee and Varadon had, uh, this and this, and Dembo and Lubetsky said, okay, you can actually really specify exactly the number of edges, okay, and, and still have the same result. Okay. Anyway, um, now the problem with this theorem is that it doesn't tell you what's the constant, okay? So it's the, uh, the, the solution of some optimization problem. Uh, the following optimization problem is, okay, so I, I look among all symmetric functions from the unit square to the to zero one by symmetric I mean in the two variables right so g x y is g y x okay and I constrain to the functions whose integral is e and whose sort of funny triple kind of integral is tau okay you can probably I mean maybe you prefer to think of this as the trace of the integral operator cubed okay thinking about my function G as a, as a kernel of an integral operator. All right, and among all the functions satisfying those, yes. And capital H is edge density, right? Uh, capital H is the same H as before, the entropy function. Okay, okay, I see. okay. P log one over P plus, okay. Is it, is it, is it somehow possible to see from this optimization problem, many cases. I'm sorry, I only heard the first half. Uh, is it is it easy to see from this optimization that for many pairs E and tau we have actually answer zero? Uh, you mean uh, to get this this picture? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean this picture. Uh, that would be interesting, actually. I mean, uh, the proof of this picture used quite different methods. Uh -huh. But I, I actually, yeah, it's something I wondered whether you can uh, get this by studying the, the this uh, very this by studying it from the point of view of uh, of these functions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know whether it would be a difficult problem because I haven't thought about it. I actually thought at some point that if I had a graduate student that was interested in this, I would ask them. Um, okay. Yeah. Right, because exactly, okay, I mean, it's, it's not immediate from the way I've, I've said it, but, uh, but you can phrase the, the question of do there exist graphs 
exactly as the question of do there exist functions G satisfying these two constraints? Those two problems are equivalent. Okay. Um, so now, okay, so if you can solve this optimization problem, then it turns out not only do you know what's the constant, right? So I, I guess I didn't write it, but, uh, but this is the optimum value of the optimization problem. The constant in the exponent is the optimum value of the optimization problem. So if you find an explicit solution, then you have the, the, uh, you know, the, the constant in the exponent. And in fact, uh, the, the theorem says that you learn a little bit more. So I haven't written very, very precisely uh, what, it, what this means, but if you can show that the optimizer here is unique, and I put an asterisk on unique because there is an obvious uh, non-uniqueness here, which is that if G is a maximizer, then so is G of phi of X, phi of Y for every measure preserving map of the interval to itself, the big measure preserving. But modulo this obvious non-uniqueness, uh, if you can show that there is a unique maximizer, then it tells you some information about what does it mean for a typical graph with these parameters. Like if I take a graph, a random graph with these parameters, then with high probability, it will something something. Okay. okay. So this is the sort of general theorem that tells you uh, about the, you know, the, um, the variational characterization of this, uh, of, this, uh, optim of this constant, okay? And, and the main problem that I wanna talk about is, is how do you solve this, okay? Now, let me maybe take a step back. This, I don't know. I don't know how familiar this stuff is with, with people, but I think it's maybe worth saying. Uh, what's the role of these functions G? Right? Because the functions G are actually part of a very nice theory of what's called graph limits, which was developed in the last maybe 20 or so years. Um, and uh, I just very, very briefly tell you, uh, tell you what the story is. So, um, okay, symmetric measurable functions on the square, we call them graph ones, okay? Um, we put a metric on the space of graph ones. This is called the cut metric. And it looks a little bit like the total variation metric except that instead of uh, taking the supremum over arbitrary subsets, I look only at the supremum over product sets. And this turns out actually to make it a much, much weaker metric. I'll show an example in a minute of, of, that helps you maybe understand how, how weak a metric it is. Okay, but anyway, it's a metric on the space of graph ones. Okay. Now there is a very natural inclusion map from graphs to graph ones. And the way it works is, so let's say, I think I had, uh, okay, this is, I think I had 11 nodes here. Uh, yeah, something like that, okay. So I've drawn here the square, the unit square. And then in order to turn a graph into a graph one, what I do is I, I divide the interval into N segments of equal lengths. And I define my graph on, on you know, segment I, cross segment J, uh, that was I cross I, I cross J. I define my graph one to be one here, if there is an edge between vertex I and vertex J. Okay, then I define my graph one to be one in that little square. And if there is no edge between vertex I and vertex J, I define my graph one to be zero. Okay, so this clearly defines a symmetric because edges are unordered measurable function. And the claim is, that, that sort of motivates this whole, uh, this whole thing is that the collection of all graph ones is the completion under the cut metric of the graphs, okay? Which were included in the set of graph ones like this. Okay? So the whole point of graph ones is you would like to study large graphs, but they do not form a complete metric space on whatever metric you're interested in. So you consider the completion, which turns out to be graph ones, okay? So one thing to keep in mind, um, which I, one second, this graph ones, you can add them, right? You can, uh, you can multiply, it's, it's a linear space, right? They take values between zero and one. Yeah, ah, uh, no, you can multiply and you can add it between zero yeah. and one, okay. Maybe you can add them, but not all of this, right? Yeah. Um, so one thing that's, that's interesting here is that, so the graph ones that I define like this, 
with this inclusion, they take values only zero and one. And yet when you take limits under the cut metric, you get all kinds of other values. And a good example to keep in mind is suppose I take a graph from the random graph model GNP, by which I mean you have N nodes and every one of them independently, you make an edge with, sorry, every pair of them independently, you connect with probability P. So what does this graph look like as a graph one? Well, you have a very, very sort of dense partition here, right? And there's a very sort of disordered collection of ones in it, right? About P fraction of the space is covered with ones, but it's in a sort of very disordered way, right? And it turns out that in the metric G, um, these random graphs, I'm sorry, converge to the constant graph on that's P everywhere, okay? So this, it's not, it's not the weak topology, but it's a little bit like the weak topology in the sense that, you know, very dense local fluctuations converge to something constant. Okay. Okay, so this was mostly all that I had planned to tell you about graphons, but I just, you know, wanted to write down that optimization problem in a slightly different way. Okay, it's the same thing that was on the previous slide, but instead of symmetric measurable functions, G from zero, one squared to zero, one, I've said graphons. Okay. And this is somehow like really the meaning, like this term here, which is called the entropy of a graphon, really represents somehow the logarithmic or the, the logarithmic number of graphs that are close to that graphon. Okay. Okay, so that's a uh, Graphons in one slide. And okay, so now let me tell you what is believed about these edge triangle graphons. Okay, so first of all, I say a graphon is k-podal if it's basically, you know, you divide up your square into k, like some k by k grid, and your graphon is constant on each piece. Okay. So there was a conjecture maybe five years or so ago that says that for every feasible choice of E and tau, the optimal edge triangle graph one, so that is the maximizer of that problem I wrote on the previous slide, is k-podal. Okay. This is still mostly open. Um, and in fact, okay, the conjecture sort of rather more than this, I have a picture here. So again, this is not to scale, but this triangle in, in light blue is the, is the feasible triangle, okay, of all, of all feasible parameters. Uh, this curve in red here is the curve uh, tau equals e cubed. So I, I took this, uh, I took this uh, picture from a paper where e is epsilon. So every epsilon here is an e. Okay, and the interior of the triangle here is divided up into countably many phases where they have a conjectured optimizer of this variation of problem on each phase. Okay, and they've given the phases, um, you know, names and numbers, a, b, c, and F for some reason, okay? And uh, there get to be countably many of them as you approach this corner of the triangle. Uh, the numbers have to do something, well, okay, so the numbers have to do, first of all, with the, with the K. So K is the sum of the two numbers here. Uh, and they also have to do, the reason there's two numbers there is that they have to do with symmetries. So this A30 has, has three podes which are fully symmetric and the B21 has two podes which are symmetric and one which isn't and, and, and so on. Okay. Right. Now this, uh, this, uh, this whole picture was basically done numerically actually, it was quite interesting. So apparently what happened was um, they, uh, they were interested in knowing, you know, what are the optimizers for this thing, right? So they, they had sort of various schemes for how they were gonna compute them numerically. Like you can approximate any graph on, by a multi, by a k-podal graph one, right? Just by taking a very fine grid, or you could approximate it with splines, or you could approximate it with some other basis functions. And so they had a plan to just sort of do a few of these and see if they got anything interesting. And as it happened, they tried the k-podal one first, and they realized very quickly that in fact uh, there's no need to really approximate it by taking k large. You really want to take, you know, k to be like two basically for most of the parameters, or three. Okay, and that's really where the conjecture came from. Um, let's see. 
So the, the main result that I want to tell you about today is that we prove this conjecture. We prove the, yeah, yeah, sorry, was there a question? Uh, yeah, a small question. So uh, the meaning of conjecture is that optimum is relatively simple graphs, right? Yes, exactly. Yes, mm -hmm. these are like finite parameter families of graphs. Yeah. Um, so the main result is that, okay, so I mean, I've, I've cheated maybe a little bit by putting this in the main result because 90% of the work was done in a previous paper by uh, Kenyon and Raiden and Rand and Sidun. Okay, for, this, for this, this one that I'm drawing here. So basically there is some small neighborhood above the curve, uh, tau, uh, tau equals E cubed, and some small neighborhood below the curve tau equals E cubed just in this half. Okay in which we solve this variational problem. Okay, and uh, we can write down what the optimal graphons are. Uh, we can compute their entropies, everything like that. Okay. okay so there is, there's a unique, oh, ah, and, and this is important. We show that the optimizer is unique in these regions. Okay, and that's important because if you remember one of the things I told you about the, the sort of general theory of this problem is that if there is a unique optimizer, then you learn something about the structure of the graphs. Okay, so let's see. So do, do we need to read this theorem? Yeah, so for every E between zero and one, so this is the statement above the curve, uh, which as I said, was mostly done in a previous work of, of these four. Uh, and this is the statement below the curve, okay, which is really the main new one. Okay. Um, one of these- I have a question. Yes, please. Joe, on the line when, tau equals e cube or optimizer yes. g is just constant, right? Exactly, constant e. Okay. okay. Yes. Ah, and the constant graph on e has this entropy. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that the two cases we have above and below the curves, as, as you approach the curve, the entropy is continuous, right? It approaches e. There is something interesting here, by the way. So I, I sort of snuck it in in a way that you may not have seen it, but above the curve, I ask, I want to raise the triangle density by delta squared, okay? And I pay order delta squared in the entropy in order to raise the triangle count by delta squared. Below the curve, if I want to lower the count triangle density by delta cubed, I pay delta squared. By the way, there's a plus here, but it's really a minus because this thing is negative in, in, the, in the interval we care about, okay? okay? So, Above the curve, it's much cheaper to gain extra triangles than it is below the curve to remove triangles. Okay. This was something, okay, this, this sort of qualitative feature was actually known before. Okay, but, but the new thing is that we actually solve the, the optimization problem. Okay, ah, and I was gonna say, so, so at least, okay, so that, you know, I think they wouldn't be offended if I said that, uh, that Charles and Lorenzo were physicists and um, they were sort of interested in this from the point of view of phase transitions. And so the, the thing that's relevant about this result is that it's the first um, in, in this whole uh, conjectured phase diagram, this is the first really phase transition that's, that's been known. Okay, because we are able to do an open region above the curve and an open region below the curve. Okay. So, ah, and I have your pictures of what the optimizing graphons look like. So this is the constant graph on E on the curve, okay? If you go above the curve, this is E plus delta squared, right? This is, I have E plus delta squared, uh, E cubed plus delta squared triangles, okay? And what happens is, okay, so the value of this graph on is mostly E, but uh, you have this region here where it's one minus E and one minus E, and then you have this third region here, which is a little bit more complicated, but it doesn't matter because it's small. Okay. And then, and, and the width, so the area of the one minus E is order delta squared. Okay, so the width of this thing is order delta squared. And when you go below, you have here E, you have here just a little bit, uh, a little bit uh, more than E, 
e plus delta or so, e plus delta, I think. And this is one minus e. Okay. And again, the area of this is order delta squared, uh, but the length of it is order delta. Okay, so these are the optimizers. We can, I mean, uh, we can compute. And so there, there's a bunch of parameters here, right? I could, could tell you what's the width of this. Uh, this is not actually E, it's approximately E, right? I can tell you all of these parameters of which there are, let's see, so there's the width of this, there's one, two, three more numbers. So there's four parameters and I can tell you them all to whatever accuracy you want. I mean, it's, you just have, you know, there's some recursion that you solve and you get them. Okay. Uh, let's see. Okay, so here I have them bigger, and I've just stated the corollary, um, right? Which is because we know that the optimizer is unique. If you take a typical graph with edge density e and triangle density just a little bit bigger than e cubed, then it looks like this. Okay, where by looks like this, I mean there is a partition of the nodes into a fraction of this many nodes and a fraction of this many nodes, such that you know the density of edges. So the edges basically look random, conditioned on having the appropriate densities between the, the various parts of the components. I don't know if that. Okay. Um, and we know the same thing is true uh, on the right. Okay, this is what a typical graph looks like if I condition it on having less triangles than it would like to have. Okay. So, Ah, okay, here's a bonus one. Okay, uh, I I'm not really going to talk very much about this, but uh, okay, the point here is that um, what I was asking for in the previous was what we call large deviations, right? It's saying I want to know what's the probability or, or how many graphs are there that have a triangle count which is like not order, uh, not n squared. Uh, okay. Before I was saying I want a triangle density to be e cubed plus something macroscopic, right? D uh, let's see, I'll, let me give you that one. E cubed minus delta cubed, right? Like a macroscopic change. But you could also ask, okay, what if this thing is allowed to depend on it? Okay, in which case, instead of moderate deviation, instead of large deviations, we call this moderate deviations. Okay, and the answer is, it turns out, so this, you know, this is the same as the previous one. Okay, so if you made a guess as to what the moderate deviations behavior would be by just writing down the formula for the large deviations and say, I'm going to take my parameter to be infinitesimal, then your guess would be correct. Okay, as long as the infinitesimal thing is not too small. Okay, um, okay, I, I, the techniques for this one are quite different. I'm, I wasn't really going to say anything about them. Uh, let me just mention that we conjecture that this is sharp, okay, the n to the minus three fourths, we believe is the right uh, sort of exponent for the, the behavior to be the same as it is in the large deviations case. Uh, there is a result known when t is much smaller than n to the minus one. And so our conjecture is that uh, our result is sharp and this should be n to the minus three fourths, okay? And, uh, in these two different regimes, you see two quite different behaviors, right? I mean, different exponents here, different exponents here. Okay, so there really is sort of a, a dichotomy between the, the number of graphs, okay, um, having edge and certain edge and triangle densities, right? Maybe, okay, I'll say one more sentence about this, which is that, um, okay, the one on top is what you would get if you took the large deviations behavior that I'm talking about today and extrapolated it for infinitesimally small parameters. The one you get on the bottom is what you would get if you take the central limit theorem behavior for the number of triangles, which has a central limit theorem, and you extrapolate it for extra large deviations. Okay. And the, the exponent n to the minus three fourths is the point where these two things cross over. So that's sort of the natural uh, guess for where the boundary between these behaviors is. Okay, but that was sort of an aside. I mainly want to talk about the large deviations today. And let me just say a little bit also about previous works because this is part of a, a topic that's had lots of works over the years. Um, most of the work has been in sparse graphs. Okay, so, so okay, there's two things. Most of the work has been for the graph model GNP, 
right? Which is the graph model, again, where I take n vertices and I put each edge in with probability p, okay? Now, this is different from the graph model that I'm considering today, where you constrain the number of edges and the number of triangles, okay? What's the difference between weighting and constraining? Well, it depends. Okay, so it turns out that when the graph is sparse, there's not much difference between weighting and constraining. Okay, so you can do these, these two problems. They're basically the same. It's been studied for a long time. Um, there was, uh, um, yeah, okay. Lots is known about it. Okay, maybe I, I don't wanna get into too much details. Um, in some cases, the leading exponent is known. Okay, so it's known like what's the probability of seeing certain triangle deviations uh, to the accuracy of what's the leading, uh, what's the coefficient in front of the leading term of the exponent, so that's which is the same as the results we have here. Okay, but I do not know of any situations where the structure of the conditioned random graphs is known. Okay, the reason for this is that when we talk about dense graphs, we have these graphons, and there's a very nicely developed theory of limits for dense graphs. And that's really where we know about the uniqueness. And since this theory doesn't exist for sparse graphs, uh, I don't know of any results where you, you actually really get this uniqueness. Okay. There is some work for dense graphs. Um, now, the interesting thing about dense graphs is that there is a big difference between weighting and constraining. And I think the, the easiest way to explain this is with an example. Um, suppose I, I give you a random graph with let's say p equals a half, right? So I, I consider g n one half, which is the same thing as saying a uniformly random graph among all possible graphs. Okay. And I condition it on having slightly fewer triangles. Okay, so g n conditioned on tau of g is smaller than the expectation minus something small. Okay, what will the graph look like? It turns out that the graph will look like a GNP graph with slightly smaller P, okay? By far the most likely way that you will see fewer triangles in a random graph is if your random graph just happened to be less dense, okay? You can see this from the, the comparison between, okay, what's the entropy cost? So in our results, the entropy cost, the entropy cost of this is of the order delta squared, okay? If you want to preserve the number of edges and reduce the number of triangles by delta cubed, you pay delta squared in entropy. But if you want to just make the graph, graph sparser, you pay only delta cubed in entropy. So it's much cheaper to do that. Okay. So that's the big difference between weighting and constraining in large deviations for dense graphs. Okay. And a, an interesting thing that comes out of it is, suppose you want to see a graph with edge density one half and triangle density just a little bit bigger than one eighth, okay? You will never ever see it if you condition a GNP graph, okay? Because what happens is, let's say I start with a denser GNP graph and I, and I condition that I'm having fewer triangles. What will happen is the graph will become sparser and sparser until at some point there's sort of a non-uniqueness and it jumps somewhere else, okay? But you will never ever in this conditioning ever see a graph that has just a little bit fewer than the triangles you expect, okay? So in order to see this, in other words, you really need to condition the uh, number of edges, okay? Now, there are some sort of uniqueness. Um, so my phone is ringing. Let me just... Uh, Silence my cell phone, but my office phone doesn't uh, have a silence button as far as I know. Okay. Um, there are some uniqueness results for this dense case. Okay. But um, the only uniqueness results that I know of are is this thing that I told you about. Like, if you want to lower the triangles, then you just get a graph with fewer edges. That's, and, and then that, that's known to be unique, okay? But there are no known uniqueness results where the optimal graph on is anything but constant. Okay, so this is the first result that I know of that type. Okay. So I wanna give some sort of very vague ideas of the proof. This is actually sort of um, a, a slightly kind of dissatisfying proof because, um, well, so you'll see what the ideas are. But the actual proof, I mean, everything that I say here, you need to get estimates for, 
And so in order to actually do it, you know, you have pages and pages of estimates uh, without, as far as I can tell, all that much insight. Okay. Um, so there's basically two steps in the proof. Okay, the first one is we need to show that an optimizer is bipodal, by which I mean, you know, k-podal with k equals two. Okay? And then once you've shown that an optimizer is bipodal, well, you've reduced it to a finite dimensional problem. Okay? You have some sort of optimality conditions, right? You're, it's a finite dimensional uh, constrained optimization problem. You write down, you know, Lagrangians and blah, 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 and you show that the solution is locally unique. Okay, because in part one, you show that you approximately have the parameters that you expect, and so you need to show that the, that the, um, the various equations you get have a local unique solution. Okay, I'm not going to say anything more about part two. Okay. Okay, so part one, I want to show that any optimizer is, is, a, is bipodal and that it has approximately the parameters that we expect it to have. Okay, so basically, as you maybe guess just by seeing the picture, right, we have, you know, this curve. And we are perturbing around the curve, right? So it's going to be a perturbative argument, right? I have a graph on, and I think of my graph on as being on the curve plus a perturbation. Okay. Now, what can you say about the triangle density of such a graph on? So I claim that you can lower bound the triangle density like this in terms of what it would be if the graph were just constant. Okay, minus the uh, Hilbert Schmidt norm of the perturbation or the L2 norm of the perturbation cubed. Okay, where does this come from? Well, basically, it comes from the fact that the triangle density of E plus delta G is the trace of the integral operator cubed. Okay, now what you can do is you can expand this thing and you can expand the cube. And you'll see that this is bigger than or equal to the trace of this integral operator cubed, okay? Um, minus the trace of the perturbation cubed, okay? uh, the, the integral operator of the perturbation. Okay? There's an extra term, which because, uh, okay, uh, I'm not going to do the algebra. I'll just tell you what happens to the extra term. So this is since the integral of this is zero. Okay, I'm perturbing it while maintaining the edge density, right? So the perturbation integrates to zero. Okay, and because of that, some terms cancel, and the term that's left is a square. So you get an inequality. Okay. Now, okay. Now the point is right. The, the these are all compact operators, right? Because they're all just, they have bounded kernels, okay? Um, this thing here is the sum of the cubes of the eigenvalues. And this thing here is the sum of the squares of the eigenvalues. So you do a Cauchy-Schwartz and you, or, or a Holder or whatever, and you get that inequality, okay? Now the inequality is sharp. If and only if the perturbation is rank one and orthogonal to the constant, right? Because you're, com you're, you're Comparing the L3 and L2 norms of a sequence, right? When, when are they equal? Well, when there's only one term in the sequence, okay? So that's the first bound, okay? Now, the second bound is a bound that compares the entropy cost to my of my perturbation, okay? Compared to its L2 norm, okay? Entropy cost versus L2 norm. So now you get some sort of slightly weird looking inequality. Okay, but the point is, I mean, it's, you know, this is really a pointwise argument, right? If that makes sense, right? I could, I could, you know, this is some pointwise function of delta G. This is some pointwise, you know, in integral of a pointwise function of delta G. This is an integral of a pointwise function of delta G. I need, I need to compare the two functions, right? The entropy function versus this function. Okay, and the point is that, okay, H, uh, E minus H E plus X um, minus X H prime E over X minus E squared is uh, minimized at X equals one minus E. Okay, this is really the inequality that I wrote. Okay, it's just some, you, you look at these functions, okay. 
So why are these two bullet points interesting? Well, oh yes, and the other thing is that uh, equality is attained in this inequality, if and only if, somehow I have the optimal comparison between these two functions pointwise. And when that happens is when delta G takes either the value zero or the value one minus two E. Okay. So the first inequality is sharp when I have a rank one perturbation. And the second inequality is sharp when I have a perturbation that takes two values, zero and something else. Okay. So now you put together these inequalities and say, well, if the triangle count is equal to something, then you have an upper bound for the entropy. This like just literally comes by combining the two bullet points and rearranging it a little bit. Okay. And the point is that this bound that I get from, okay, there, there's no guarantee by the way that, that I would get a sharp bound by comparing these two inequalities, right? Because I've introduced this third quantity, right? Which is sort of mediating between these two inequalities. Okay, but it turns out that the inequality I get here is sharp to within a lower order term. Delta cubed, right? How do we know? We give an example of a G, right? Namely, the G that we think is optimal matches this to within order delta cubed. Okay. So now the point is so I have two inequalities. I know when they're sharp. Okay. I know that when you combine the two inequalities, you get something sharp. Okay. And so it must be that everything is sort of approximately sharp all, all along the way, right? And so then what you need to do is you need to say, okay, you, instead of equality here, instead of equality here, you need to say what happens with almost equality. Okay, and what you get is the following. In order for G to be optimal, it must be close to rank one, and it must be close to taking the values zero and one minus two E. Okay, closeness being measured in L2. And if you play with these two a little bit, actually you see that G must be close in L2 to the thing that we believe is optimal, which is basically a function taking the value E here, E here, E here, and one minus E there. You'll notice that this is okay. It's not quite rank one. You know, I could make it rank one by changing this a little bit, right? but it's very close to rank one. Uh, it, it takes uh, the, the perturbation delta G takes really just the value zero and one minus two e. Okay. So we know at this point, just by these inequalities, that the opt any optimal graph must be close in L two to the bipodal graph. Okay. And so then the second step is just to go from being close in L2 to being close, or to being bipodal, I'm sorry. And there, you know, we use this sort of argument where, okay, so we know it's close in L2. Okay, and if it's not already bipodal, then we are gonna get a contradiction by constructing a better competitor. And the way the competitor is gonna be constructed is, we have a function which is close in L2 to this. So now we take our function and we average it on each of these components. Okay, by averaging it, we will construct a graphon which is exactly bipodal, right? Because it's constant on all the bits where I averaged. Okay, by averaging it, I preserve the edge density. Okay, I increase the entropy, right? Because entropy is concave, it increases under averages. So I've increased the entropy. I don't know what I've done to the triangle density because I don't know, like, you know, what my optimal graphon is. Okay, but presumably I've increased it. Okay. If I decrease the triangle density, then you sort of already won. So you may as well assume that you've increased the triangle density by this average. Okay. And then what you do is you've got this bipodal graph on. It has the right edge density. It has the wrong triangle density. And you just, it has four parameters, right? The size of the thing, the you know, various values on the four things, and you tweak them to get back exactly the right triangle density. Okay. And you have to do these steps sort of quite carefully in order to show that when getting back the right triangle density, you have a strictly better entropy than you started with contradicting the fact that your original was not bipodal, okay? So that's the proof modulo the fact that you need like fairly careful estimates to get all these steps to go together, okay? But I think that those are, are not so interesting. Good. Are there any questions so far? Yes. yes. Uh, can you come to the previous slide? Yes. Uh, this estimate with, with minus delta G Hilbert Schmidt cube, um, you have like trace of cube of the operator. So it's sum of eigenvalues yeah. cube. Why suddenly less than uh, sum of squares square root to the power of three halves, right? Uh, 
So let's see. So I may have gotten signs wrong. That's that's very possible. But uh, I have the sum of the eigenvalues cubed, and uh, I claim so. This is the bound that I want to use. To three halves. To the three halves. Um, it, let's see. Do I have it backwards? Is is it really true? No. Uh, why? Um, maybe uh, we, should, we should say something about where these lambdas sit. Are they between minus one and one or something like that? No? Uh, no, I don't think so. Yeah. So actually, I mean, uh, this is... Mm -hmm. th there's a 60% chance that my inequality is, is backwards. Uh, I, I think this one is correct, yes. But I'm, I'm correct, right? Yeah. yeah, I think you're correct, yes. Right? Oh yeah, yeah, that's correct by by the concavity. Yeah, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. Yes, thanks. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. I always have trouble with inequalities, especially when there are signs involved. But is, isn't that uh, slightly dangerous to use this inequality because it's a little bit rough? Maybe you have something better. Uh, in general, maybe. But in fact, in this situation, the optimal, so when is the sharp? Well, it's sharp if my sequence consists only of a single number. Yes. And in fact, this turns out to be the, the case that we're interested in mm -hmm. because the optimal perturbations are really rank one. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, it seems, uh, yeah, it, it's very, uh, very coarse. Mm -hmm. um, maybe it's worth mentioning at this point, I mean, you presumably noticed at the beginning that I'm only doing this when E is bigger than a half, right? I only claim something about the lower thing for the right half of the picture. And it's exactly because this sort of argument is too coarse. We don't know quite what to do in the other case. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, by the way, a small yeah. remark. When you consider th there was, uh, I think it was, yeah, it's right here written by your, by your hand. It's uh, different between traces trace of something cube minus sorry, sorry. something cube. I mean, there, there are general formulas, I have no idea, about the trace of uh, uh, polynomial of A minus polynomial of B. There are general formulas of this type. I think right. crane, crane, whatever. Anyway, yes. for, for traces of such differences, there are yes. different formulas. And, yes. Yeah. I mean, in this case, it's it's easier than that because it's just a cube, so we can write everything. Right, right, right. But yes, and actually, so this is, I mean, one of the one of the things that's interesting is to try and extend what we do to other graphs other than triangles. Mm -hmm. In which case, it's actually it's even more complicated than the trace of a power. It's some other sort of uh, polynomial-like thing in in the operator, but not quite the trace of a power. And, and there probably we need to use something like this. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay. So I think this was this was all about the proof that I, I really wanted to say. Everything else about the proof is is just estimating, getting estimates for all the things that I wave my hands about uh, on these few slides. Let me briefly say something about uh, what's open. Um, so the case e equals a half is open. E, e less than a half is open. Right? I had this phase diagram. We can do the case e bigger than a half. We can't do the case e less than a half. Uh, one big reason of it is uh, I had this two-step comparison where I compared how much triangles do you gain compared to L2 norm, how much entropy do you lose compared to L2 norm, and in the case E less than a half, you cannot just combine these two things and get a sharp inequality. You get something that's not sharp. Okay, it's probably related, it may be related to the fact that the eigenvalue by comparison is not, uh, is not quite good enough or that the pointwise comparison is not really reflecting, anyway, whatever, I don't really know. Okay, um, but the other thing I think that's, that's I think a very interesting question that we thought about a fair, quite a bit and, and uh, I don't have a good answer for is the conjecture is that in this whole region, everything is a multipodal graph form. Right? Everything is really a finite dimensional, finite dimensional object. And all of the arguments that we have so far in this paper, also in some previous papers, are really about perturbative estimates around something where we know what's going on. Okay, we really don't understand how to show uh, this uh, this general structure of the optimizers. Okay, and that's all. Thanks for your time. Thank you very much, Joe. That was a great talk. Oh, um, does anybody have any questions? <laughs>
So maybe it's about polynomial of degree three on Hamming cube, someone's estimates of influence. Yeah. Oh, by the way, something that's interesting is that if you take a polynomial, if you take four instead of three, then it is not possible to go below the, the you cannot have fewer than e to the four, four cycles in a graph, right? Just from, for sort of obvious reasons. I mean, it's like, you know, there's some Cauchy Schwartz in there that says that you cannot go below. Um, yeah. Okay, if uh, there are no questions, then let's thank the speaker again. Right, thanks.